is fucked up and how we hope that it gets better. And uh, also, uh, we'll talk about some tools uh, so that you can do some self-directed learning on your own. Uh, so, but a year ago, I moved to Sweden. Um, I grew up in Canada. I spent most of my adult life trying to leave Canada and was finally able to last year. Um, sometimes people find that a little bit weird because they think that Canada's wonderful, but it's attached to the Americans, and so it's not that great. Um, so, um, and it gets worse all the time. Except now we have an underwear model for a prime minister, so that's an improvement. Um, when I lived in Canada, I moved around a lot. Uh, my dad was in the Navy. This is the ship he was on in the, uh, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. Um, and uh, but recently ran aground because they didn't know how deep the water was off of Hawaii, and I just find that kind of amusing. Uh, so when I lived in Canada, I lived all over Canada, on the East Coast, the West Coast, both Navy bases, and then in the middle when my dad retired. And uh, by the time I was finished school, I had attended 13 different schools in three provinces. And so I, in order to learn anything ever, I basically had to um, develop uh, the ability to learn it by myself and uh, um, I'm not sure how many you know what the what the make of people is uh, of, of various nationalities in the room my dad was al always had nice things to say about the Danish Navy um, but it was probably because he retired before um, the conflict over Hans Island are you guys familiar with this? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, for those of you that are not, um, some Danes will be familiar um, with Canada as being the rightful owners of Hans Island. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, everyone else are wrong. Whiskey every year. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so for those that don't know, it's an island between Greenland and uh, Baffin Bay. And uh, it's on a very important shipping lane. And the Canadian and uh, Greenland border goes right across the middle of the island. Uh, but whoever owns this island also controls the shipping lanes into um, uh, the, what we call the Northwest Passage and, and that part of the north. And uh, so it, it's said that uh, uh, every year when the Danish military go, they leave a bottle of snaps and a Danish flag. And then the Canadians go and pick up the snaps and uh, leave a bottle of Canadian club and leave a Canadian flag. And apparently this has been going on for a number of years. Uh, and... Uh, so uh, I grew up, uh, it, most of my childhood was spent in uh, PMQs, which are private married quarters. These are tiny communities, 400 houses, I think. Um, it seems kind of stupid to say this in Denmark, but as children, we called these Legoland because all of the houses look exactly the same and they're painted dumb pastel colors. And so all the houses are identical except for the colors. Um, and uh, they're simple boxes. Uh, and when you grow up in a military community, it means that uh, you grow up very much the same as everyone else in your community. Your parents all have the same job, everyone earns the same amount of money, they shop in the same stores, they live in the same kinds of houses, uh, we have the same types of phrases and words that we use, um, and uh, you know, life is very much the same for everyone that lives in these communities, which is probably why I immediately felt so at home in Sweden. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, I think every kid in Canada uh, has a dream of being a professional hockey player at some point in their lives. I definitely did, uh, until my parents beat it out of me. Um, I love hockey, I'm not that good at it, and now I'm too fat. Um, and uh, some kids have this dream, uh, some, some, I mean, obviously, many Canadians uh, see this dream through. Uh, because Canadians make up most professional hockey players, as is right. Uh, but of course we don't mind importing uh, from other countries when they do it better than us. Uh, I'm not sure how many people here know hockey that well. This is Yannick Hansen, who is, I think, the Danish NHL player. Uh, he's, uh, he, he plays for my uh, beloved Vancouver Canucks. Um, most of the rest of the team is Swedish. <laughs> so, after my parents talked me out of being a uh, hockey player, I want to be a pilot. This is a CF-18, I think Canada has like eight of these and that's it. Uh, and uh, we, I want to be a pilot, but I learned that uh, you have to have perfect eyesight to be a pilot. And so my, my dreams were, my dreams were uh, cut. Uh, 
I joined Air Cadets as a child, which is like Boy Scouts except with uh, Air Force-like uniforms and uh, planes. We uh, and we would go, you know, play at airfields and pretend we were pilots, and it was it was awesome. Uh, but at some point, I had to start thinking about what I really, really could do with my life, and uh, so um, I couldn't be a pilot. I couldn't be a hockey player. And I had no idea what I want to do when I grow up. I still have no idea what I want to do when I grow up. Um, but I really liked computers, and uh, I really, really enjoyed learning new things. And so I started exploring the possibility that computers would open up. When I was born, uh, my parents bought a set of Encyclopedia Britannica. This is the 1983 edition. I think the salespeople for encyclopedias go and like camp out in maternity wards at hospitals yeah. to try and make people feel guilty for not having encyclopedias for their children that are about to be born. Um, because my parents got sucked into it. But this set of encyclopedias was my favorite thing as soon, from as soon as I could read uh, on uh, until until computers happened. Um, and. It meant that I could learn anything about anything at any time of the day, and it was amazing. But another weird thing was happening around that time. It's expensive to print these things. My parents didn't have enough money to replace this set every year or every couple of years, and there were a lot of really interesting things happening in the world at the time. In the late 80s, uh, the Cold War wasn't a big deal for Canadians uh, as it was for the, for, for the Americans, because we don't piss people off as a matter of foreign policy. Uh, but Russia was a big deal for us because as the USSR started to uh, dissolve uh, into its you know, various member states, uh, Canada became very close to being the largest country in the world, and that was a big deal for us. Because we're, we're always like, you know, we're the, we're the second at everything. We're the second worst in the world next to the Americans. Um, and so we just don't have anything awesome. And so this was something that we paid a, a lot of really close attention to. Um, so the encyclopedias and textbooks were immediately out of date. Every, back in the late 80s and early 90s, every few, every few weeks there was a new country popping up. And uh, I, I found it deeply personally offensive that the textbooks, the atlases, the encyclopedias were all wildly out of date uh, when all of this was going on. It was very difficult to find current information about what was happening on the other side of the world because we get enough, in Canada, we get enough of the American influence to not actually give a shit about the rest of the world. And so it's really hard to find uh, the information that we're looking for. And so, how were we supposed to learn anything if the world was changing faster than the tools that we use to understand it? This is why I became uh, interested in computers. It was my third grade teacher's fault. It was my fault, but it was, uh, it was her doing. Um, my interest in computers started early because in the third grade, I was finishing my work faster than, uh, than the rest of the kids. Um, and I was, uh, I know this will come as a surprise to many people, I was being very disruptive uh, to the rest of the class. And so my teacher decided that she needed a way to uh, basically tell me to fuck off. And so she said, hey, there's a computer in the corner, why don't you figure out how to play with it? <laughs> and uh, she didn't know how to use it. It was, you know, at this point, I think that the school got a bunch of Commodore 64s. They had them on little carts and stuff and spread them out around the, around the room. Uh, around the school, and then they just sort of forgot about them, and uh, it, they, they were just there. Um, and so I, I went around and I had to figure out how to use it from manuals. Um, I spent my paper route money to buy magazines that had code printouts and stuff. I'm not sure how many people here have worked on these kinds of computers, but you, you used to spend hours and hours meticulously typing in entire programming listings just to get some stupid game. That you couldn't save because my school didn't spring for the cassette tape storage. Um, but one of the cool things that I thought immediately when I when I got this was there's all this cool stuff happening in the world, all this information is changing, and we can make our own materials to show what's going on in the world. And so this is not a screenshot of the program that I wrote, but it is reminiscent of. 
I made a program on the Commodore 64 that showed Russia, uh, the USSR dissolving into its member states, and uh, and then we used that around the school to to to, uh, to demonstrate what was going on. So I started writing educational software um, when I was in the like fourth grade. Um, our textbooks and atlases didn't have the current information. It was really difficult to find information on it. Our teachers uh, were not well informed on the issues. Um, and, and what was happening, and so all we had, to, uh, all I had to work with was whatever information I could find and whatever computer programs I could write to uh, to share that information. And so I pieced together what I could, uh, making animations and stories, just so that I could get a better understanding of the world. And I guess it kind of helped other people as well. Because I was having a lot of fun with the computer at school, my dad got us a Tandy 1000. This is not my Tandy 1000 because I would have kicked the cat. Um, but uh, we had a Tandy 1000, and uh, I used it for writing and creating small programs and um, you know spreadsheets and running calculations and trying to figure out um, you know how the world worked. I've I've I, I guess uh, since I started using computers, I wanted to figure out how the world worked through um, my use of, uh, of computers and software. One of the cool things, did you have BBSs in Europe? Yeah. Was this a yeah. thing? Yeah? yeah, okay. So we had, uh, when we got our second computer, I was finally able to connect to BBSs. Uh, and so this allowed me to c connect to other people and get information from other places. And that was a life changer. Um, Another interesting side effect of this was because my dad signed up for all the BBS accounts and then went away to sea for nine months at a time. I had access to all the adult content on the BBS. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was the only 11 or 12 year old boy that did not uh, uh, access the adult content because I was too busy downloading RFCs and reading books like How to Build Your Own Compiler and stupid things like that. <laughs> My life may have turned out much better if I had accessed the adult content instead. Um, instead, I talked to boxes for a living. So uh, the encyclopedias were fun, but as soon as you can start connecting to other people and getting other information and asking questions of experts and communicating with people that are not only not in your own community, but um, but but further out, and BBSs were not like the internet, so it was it was you were generally limited to your city or your province or your or your country. But as soon as you could start talking to other people, that changed things dramatically, at least for me and and, and in my uh, uh, wish for for finding internet, uh, for finding access to information rather. Um, so another thing that happens when you live in a military community is you get a military dependent card, which means I got to go on military base. Um, the kids on a military base are called base brats in North America. I don't know if that's a thing here. Um, and so as a base brat, I could go to the Royal Roads Military College. Um, this is the famous building, because that's an old building in Canada, but here it's just a building. Um, <laughs> and so um, the house I live in is like 300 years older than that building. Uh, so, so uh, th this is the, the building, if you watch uh, a couple of TV shows like Smallville or um, some of the X-Men movies, this building is in it. And that was on the Royal Roads Military College campus. Uh, but I didn't care about that building, I cared about this building. That building is the Royal Roads Military College um, library. And I used to ride my bike from school when I was like 10 or 11 years old so that I could go hang out in the library because they had all the good programming books. Um, so I could go and find really, really cool programming books in the military college library, and then uh, go home and try out cool things. And uh, it was really fantastic. They had some really neat books there on the operating systems that go on things like, um, uh, I, I actually worked as an adult, I worked on a project uh, where we wrote software for Sona Boys, which are these things like sort of torpedo shaped this big and they run software and you drop them out of a plane and then they they look for submarines so that you know where to aim the guns. And uh, they had some really, really neat books on that that were that I found really interesting when I was like 12. Um, and so that was really cool. I spent a lot of time in this library. 
you might be able to imagine the uncomfortable phone call that I had to have with Compact Tech Support when um, when I was 12 and I made my own operating system and caused the computer to not be able to boot anymore. Um, this is before the internet, this is before satellite telephones and things like this, so my dad was on a deployment uh, somewhere in the Pacific Rim. Uh, he was gone, I think, on a six-month trip. We're about one month into a six-month trip. We wouldn't hear from him for three months, and the computer was broken, and my, my life was ruined. Uh, so I had to call the tech support people, uh, handing the phone to my mom so she could give them the credit card number so that they could tell me how to un unfuck the computer because I tried to make my own operating system and failed. Um, the real turn for me in computing was when uh, what we used to call multimedia, and I think that's a, a phrase that has unfortunately fallen out of use. Um, when we first got Encyclopedia Britannica on CD-ROM at my school, I used to stay after school every day just to use it. And I couldn't take the CDs home, but I could go to the library after, after school every day and look at Encyclopedia Britannica and learn about whatever I wanted. Um, Microsoft Encarta was the welfare version of uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Sorry, um, room full of Europeans. Uh, in North America, welfare is a bad word. Uh, and so uh, I would stay as long as the librarian would let me and just look up random shit. And it was the coolest thing in the world because I felt like I had the entire knowledge, the entire collective knowledge of the world on a disc and I could just do whatever I wanted and learn whatever I wanted. And there was no structure to this. I just picked out something that I thought was cool and I would read about it. And I would watch movies and, and stuff. So when I, when, I was, uh, when I was, I don't know, 13, I think, I asked for one of these for my birthday, which is the Sound Blaster Multimedia Kit. Uh, it's a CD-ROM, a sound card, and some speakers. So you can upgrade your computer so it'll play the encyclopedia. That was all I wanted for my 13th birthday, was to be able to get encyclopedias on my computer so I could be even more antisocial than usual. And it was fantastic. Um, once I had this and some BBS accounts, I was connected to the outside world. I had access to all the information I could possibly dream of, and, uh, and I could play awesome games because I had some tinny speakers. Another thing that changed my life in those times, uh, in the mid-90s, um, was being involved in user groups. Uh, I was one of the founding members of the Victoria Linux Users Group, which was one of the first Linux users groups on the west coast of Canada. And uh, something really amusing happened here. A few people had started this group, and at the end of the meetings, they would go to the pub. And of course, I think I was 13 or 14. Uh, and so in North America, or in Canada, not a civilized country, uh, children can't go into pubs. And so we had to switch to the family restaurant that was licensed, which in Canada is called Boston Pizza. It's kind of like a TGI Fridays or whatever. So we had to go there because uh, it was the only place in town that had beer and I was allowed in um, as a minor. And so uh, amusingly, so this was in like 1994, in about 2010, uh, I went to give a talk at the Vila Group and Afterwards, we went to Boston Pizza, and I had to sit around the table while everyone was complaining that if we didn't have these damn kids, we wouldn't have to go to the family restaurant. We could go to the actual pub. And uh, so it was nice to see that, uh, you know, more than a decade later, they were still going to the boring family restaurant um, <laughs> in order to be inclusive to the children that wanted to play with computers. Mm -hmm. So, because I didn't live in a civilized country, uh, all of my self-directed education, everything I learned about computers and otherwise, paid off very well for me um, when I got the bad news about university. Um, I always assumed, as a, as a child and a, a teenager, that I would get to go to university, um, because that's what you do. Um, even though in my family it wasn't really a normal thing, in my extended family, I think I have like 45 odd cousins or so, um, in my extended family I would have been the first one to go to university. I'm still the only one that has gone to university. Um, and I didn't even really go that long, I just showed up a few times. Um, but it was really, the, the news I got was that um, my family, my dad, uh, his salary was too high for me to get a student loan to pay for university. 
but it was too low for him to afford to save money to pay for my tuition. And so I was just completely unable to go to university. Uh, this is because in North America we think it's fun to screw the middle class. Um, so uh, people who were poorer than my family, no problem. People who were richer than my family, also no problem. But people in the middle were just completely screwed. Uh, fortunately, um, there, was some, th there was something excellent that was about to happen. Uh, and so I caught a lucky break while I was still in high school because software programmers were in such high demand that they didn't give a shit if you had a university degree or not. They just cared if you could get the job done. And so uh, employers stopped caring about education and it, it just didn't matter. Then the bubble burst and by the time the bubble burst I had already had three or four years of experience so I was a you know, grizzled veteran of the industry at that point. Um, <laughs> And so I had lots of experience and contacts, and so I was able to maintain demand all the way through. Um, we are in the middle of a wicked bubble right now, uh, which is also terrible, but, uh, but it, it, you know, it's, it's good if you come into well prepared. So uh, I always find these amusing. Uh, because I didn't have a degree, and to be a software programmer you have to have a degree, or so people think, my mom would always ask me, when are you going to stop playing with computers and get a real job? Uh, and I mean, this was as recent as um, like just a couple of years ago, I was the VP of software for a publicly traded finance company in Toronto, and my mom said, when are you going to stop playing with computers and get a real job? <laughs> that wasn't the best part. She said, well, your cousin, who's a roofer, they're looking for people. You can go and put roofs on out. <laughs> and I... You know, it, I felt like a bit of a dick, and I said, Mom, the people that I employ make more money than the roofers at you know, my cousin's company. Not that I think that's good. I think software people are overpaid. Um, but, uh, but it was just, it's, it's this weird situation where uh, people who do you know, real things uh, don't do as well as the people who do fake things. Um, and so I don't know when I'm going to stop playing with computers and get a real job. Um, I'm hoping it's soon. <laughs> so uh, since we're in a, in a massive bubble right now, I'm still not sure that I won't someday be unemployed. I spent, in post dot bomb, I was working two full-time jobs as a software developer and also working as a mall cop at various points, uh, a, uh, a dock worker, and I worked for a moving company on the weekends because I was absolutely certain that the bubble was going to burst and all the software people would be unemployed and I would have to get a real job. And so I kept doing the real jobs on the side, just in case. Um, I still think that I'm probably going to be unemployable as a software person pretty soon. Uh, it just doesn't make me as sad as it used to. Um, so so there, uh, when, when this bubble bursts, we'll all do something different and you know, hopefully we'll still have Fuka Fe to come to and talk about the good old days. So what I what I talked about is my sort of weird education and uh, the crazy stuff that I did. What I haven't talked about is traditional education. This section of the talk is light because um, there are a lot of people talking about educational reform right now and most of them are idiots. And uh, I don't have enough knowledge about education and how education is delivered to be able to pick out the idiots from the not idiots and so I want to be very careful what I'm delivering. Um, so in traditional education we have compulsory grade school which apparently Denmark was one of the first countries in the world to have compulsory grade school education for children. Um, uh, back in the 18th century it was you know one single room schoolhouse uh, that doesn't look like Danish to me. I'm sure this building is from some other place. Uh, and uh, single room, kids of all ages, one teacher, uh, and many students didn't finish because they eventually had to quit in order to work and support their families. Uh, unfortunately, not in Canada, because Canada is a little bit more civilized, but in the United States where Max is from, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who still have to quit high school to go and support their families because uh, because Donald Trump's going to be president, <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so in the Industrial Revolution, we kept doing the school thing, 
but we made more structure uh, we made it a more structured educational system to cram more kids through so that they could have some education because um, these machines here you can see uh, children have really small fingers and so they operate the machines in a much better way than adults with fat fingers can and so it's really important to have the kids that could uh, operate the machines effectively and so they had to go to school uh, it was, education was finally seen as something for children but it was also seen as a linear thing. You, you're born, you do baby things, then you go to school, and then you stop going to school and you become an adult, and you join the real world. Um, Sir Ken Robinson is one of the guys who writes a lot about educational reform, uh, and he's, he's talking a lot lately about educational revolution. Um, and uh, uh, he, he said the idea of linearity, that education starts here and you go through a track, and if you do everything right, you will wind up set for the rest of your life. Is, is the idea that he thinks uh, um, we need to get away from, this idea that education is linear. And the idea is that education should be more organic. I want to learn about these things, and so I learn about these things at this point in my life. And later on, I'll learn about these other things that, in, in this other part of my life where those things are relevant. And that's a really important thing. Um, Ken Robinson has done several TED Talks. They're only 20 minutes each. So it's definitely something you should, uh, you should watch. It's not in the list of tools, but TED Talks are pretty good for that. The reason why I don't talk about TED Talks a lot is because when you have an amazing speaker who has a larger body of work, like Ken Robinson, um, and there's other material that you can get from that person, then TED Talks are really great as an introduction to, to whet your appetite for learning more and reading more from that person. Uh, TED Talks are often, you know, just sort of pithy 20 minutes. You really can't get a lot of detail out of 20 minute talks. Uh, so, so anyway, so definitely someone you should check out. So I wanna share, I, I looked up some, some statistics and uh, they're all pretty depressing. Uh, but this, this number, uh, you may recognize uh, that is the, a the uh, answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Yeah. Okay, it's also the percentage of Americans who will never read a book after they graduate. Now, I suspect in civilized countries that number is a lot lower. But uh, nearly half of Americans finish school and never read another book in their entire life. That means that uh, they don't learn anything new, necessarily. You can learn, of course, you can learn by doing and things like that, but there are not many things, even in software, where we, where we don't like dead trees and we don't like analog mediums, necessarily. It's very difficult to learn new things, even about computing without reading a book. And so if you fall into this nearly half, then you won't learn new things. Uh, so, I think, I also think it's kind of amusing because uh, one of the things I noticed since moving to Sweden is how much the Swedes worship Americans. The Swedes worship people who nearly half uh, won't read a book in their life in adulthood. Um, I just find that really amusing. So, um, these things are terrible and they're, 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 they're pervasive. Um, so there are alternative forms of education uh, that people are, are discussing, and they don't even, they're not even necessarily new. Um, the Waldorf education is uh, one of the two that's really popular in the hippie parts of Canada that I'm from. Um, uh, also known as Steiner education after Rudolf Steiner, uh, who sort of <coughs> designed it in, in the 1920s. Um, the idea is that you're going to emphasize imagination um, and encourage people to have a very broad and general understanding and education around the world. So uh, children, and I, I know several of them, do you have Waldorf a lot in, in Denmark? We have Steiner. Okay. So uh, in Canada we call it Waldorf, um, but it's the same thing. And so in these types of schools, you have, uh, the, the kids that go to these schools are very broad, general, uh, well, sort of well-rounded, generally, uh, generally educated. They know things, they, they, they explore the arts, they explore the sciences, um, and they just have a really generally well-rounded education. Uh, Montessori is the other thing that's sort of popular in the how do we fix education circles. 
um, and it emphasizes freedom and self-directed study, you have mixed age classrooms, but because it's self-directed, you wind up with a lot of students who will specialize. And so a lot of the schools, at least were, when I looked into them when I was working in educational software in the west coast of Canada, you wind up with the Montessori schools are trying to pick out at an early age, this child is good at math, so we're going to make them do lots of math, and this child is good at drawing, so we're going to make them draw lots. The thing that I find really amusing is that uh, the hippie parents will say, uh, well, I want my kid in either a Waldorf or a Montessori school, without realizing that they are exact polar opposites of each other, and you should probably pick one or the other, um, because they're, they're not really compatible. Not only are they not compatible, they're exactly opposite. Um, this popped up on Twitter the other day. When you can get the same education with a basic internet connection now, why college? For the resume stamp, that needs to change and fast. This, uh, this slide's probably in the wrong place because I'm going to talk about tools now. Um, so, because we have in our we have very powerful computers in our pants, um, we can now get access to all of the information in the world ever and communicate with each other uh, just by reaching into our pants. And. Um, there are a lot of ways to reach out and get access to this information. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about some of the things that you can look at um, to, to find that information. The first place is always going to be your friends and your community. User groups are really important for this. Um, I'm sure everyone here has a friend who is an absolute expert in something, and that's the person that you call when you have a problem with something. I don't have a traditional computer science education. I do not feel like I missed out because I have so many friends who have traditional computer science educations, I just send them a message and say, hey, I'm trying to do this thing and I think I want this, but it might be kind of like this. And one of my friends will just tell me, here are the three papers you need to read and here's a Wikipedia article. And that is, that's, the, uh, that's an amazing opportunity to just reach out to your friends and ask them questions. People who are experts in things generally like to help you. Um, it doesn't hurt for somebody to tell you, uh, hey, these are the three papers you should read. Here's something interesting that you might be interested in. Um, you should definitely feel free to reach out to your friends. Uh, Wikipedia is the collected knowledge of the entire world, all in one place, and it's absolutely lovely. Um, someone called Wikipedia an encyclopedia-themed MMORPG. And there is actually now a Wikipedia page on Wikipedia the MMORPG. And it has bosses and levels and power-ups and so on. Um, and it's really amusing. The important thing to keep in mind when you look at Wikipedia is because it's an encyclopedia-themed video game, um, you have to be very careful about checking references, obviously. You have to be very careful where this information is coming from, how it's biased, and, uh, and, and who put it there. Uh, there was a Wikipedia page uh, on me at one point um, because I made something that people used and uh, I wasn't allowed to edit the Wikipedia page that had my name on it to correct my birth date because there was no reference to the thing. Um, so I just decided that that page can be better deleted. The thing that I created has a Wikipedia page that I am not allowed to edit and change details of when they get them wrong. So in order to get change details, so the thing that I created is called RSpec, it's a Ruby library for testing. Uh, when I need to change things on the RSpec Wikipedia page, I have to go write a comment on Hacker News and then link to that in the Wikipedia update. <laughs> um, it's just completely bonkers. Anyways, there's a lot of great information here though. Wikipedia is amazing in, uh, there's a banner when there's like a current news event where things are happening, um, when a celebrity dies specifically under mysterious circumstances, there will be a banner at the top of the page saying, hey, uh, this page is in flux right now, you should probably be careful. My favorite feature of Wikipedia though is the new feature on the mobile uh, the mobile app called Nearby. Um, this summer when we were on vacation, we accidentally ended up, um, well we ended up on purpose in Germany, we accidentally ended up about 200 meters away from the former East German border. And I found this out because the Wikipedia app told me this. And there was, 
that meant that there were tons of things that I wanted to see, and I only knew that because the Wikipedia app told me, hey, here's all these cool things that you're nearby, and here are the Wikipedia articles. And so I would read the Wikipedia articles, and then I could go visit the sites, um, and it was really neat. It was, it was uh, an, an amazing experience to read about what I was about to look at, look at it, read some more about it, and also in whatever language I want. So I can get Wikipedia in English, even though most of the signs in Germany are in, in East Germany, oddly, maybe not oddly given the history, but the signs are in German and then Russian and then sometimes English. And, uh, but the Wikipedia articles are always in English, which was really helpful. Um, MIT OpenCourseWare is absolutely amazing. You can go, they have over 2,000 courses, video lectures, assignments, uh, book lists, discussion forums. Um, nearly everything taught at MIT is available as OpenCourseWare. If you don't need classroom credit uh, for your studies and you just want to learn stuff, MIT OpenCourseWare is an amazing way to learn things. Um, I was uh, doing some computer science stump the chump a few months ago, and uh, I realized that there were a few computer science courses that I needed to, to, to bone up a little bit on. MIT OpenCourseWare had not only the lectures that I was looking for, but they had the lectures delivered by three different professors at three different time periods. So you can even find a professor that you like and watch all of the videos from that professor, which is really excellent as well. Um, so they have many, many choices for everything that you look at. Um, there's not a lot of structure. It's very self-directed. You go in, pick and choose what you want. There are a few open source apps that will let you go in and you know, sort of tick off the things that you've done so you can keep track of it, but it's very unstructured and uh, you just go in and look at videos, basically. Uh, the other thing that's now available, the Open University, is a traditional university that you can do online. So this one will actually give you course credit. I think there's a tuition cost associated with it as well. Um, the work is not as self-directed as, as the open courseware from MIT, but you do get course credit uh, and you can do a degree this way. Many, many universities are now offering this. There's Athabasca is the popular one in North America. Um, a few of the Canadian, large Canadian universities like um, University of Waterloo, which is famous because Blackberry. Um, and uh, they offer some of their stuff online, but this university, uh, Open University, is completely open and uh, you can do an entire degree there. One of the things that I've made a lot of use of uh, since moving to Sweden is Duolingo. Um, in, when I lived in Canada, I used it to learn French, um, and uh, it didn't work. Uh, but that wasn't Duolingo's fault. Um, English Canadians do terrible at French. Uh, I think deliberately. And uh, so Duolingo is fantastic. Duolingo comes from the guy who may invented reCAPTCHA. Are you familiar with reCAPTCHA? When the computer asks you to verify that you're not a robot. So the idea with reCAPTCHA is they show you two pictures put together uh, that are scanned out of a book. One is a word that they know the answer to, and the other is a word that they can't digitize. That's how reCAPTCHA works. And so you punch in both words, and they know by the one that they know whether you've got the right answer or not, and the other one, they just store your answer along with the 50,000 other people who answer it, and they th are then digitizing books. Every time you type in a reCAPTCHA, you're, you're, you're working to digitize books for people. <coughs> with Duolingo, you're actually translating things for people. So when you go through your Duolingo course, you'll answer some questions, you'll in my case, write out some Swedish sentences or whatever. And every once in a while, you only notice this because every once in a while, I know that I've answered something wrong or made a typo and Duolingo says, congratulations, you are right. Uh, that's when I know it was just trying to collect my answer to help me translate, to, to get my help in translating something. Um, another interesting thing about Duolingo, which is not related to the tool itself, uh, is this map which came out recently. You can see that in Canada, this map shows uh, what are what language are people learning uh, with Duolingo around the world. In Canada, you can see people are learning French. Parts of Africa and Australia, they're learning French. Uh, in the U.S., Greenland, they're learning Spanish. Uh, but in Sweden, they're learning Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this this was the outlier that I I got uh, ten emails from my friends who saw this and they said, Hey, do you use Duolingo in Sweden? Uh, are you the only one? 
perhaps. Um, and uh, I think it's this wonderful thing about immigration. Um, I'll have other opinions on immigration when I cross the border to go back home tonight. Um, and, uh, but I think it's this wonderful thing. But I, just, I thought it was really amusing that in Sweden, people are learning Swedish with Duolingo. And in every other country, they're learning something else. Um, another tool is Google Scholar. I do not ever recommend using anything from Google ever. Um, because uh, Google is the embodiment of everything that's wrong with computing today. But I make exceptions for Scholar and Translate. Um, because uh, there, I, I'm not aware of good alternatives. There are alternatives, there are, but they're inaccessible and difficult to use. Google Scholar is really excellent when you want to learn about something. Punch in what you want to learn about, and it will give you all the research papers related to that. And you can read real research papers. If Google Scholar tries to take your money for those research papers, you find out who wrote the paper and email them. Pro tip, the people who wrote the paper typically don't get paid. When you pay for a paper, it typically doesn't go to the people who wrote the paper. So if you just email the people who wrote the paper, they'll just send you a free copy. <laughs> um, because they just their job is to get the paper read, uh, and they're not getting any the money anyways. So, uh, um, so that, that's really fantastic. I've been reading a lot of uh, papers lately about behavioral psychology and how it applies to team building and software teams. Um, and those are really fun and super expensive. I think the papers, they go anywhere from 100, 150, 200 dollars US. Um, but I haven't yet had anybody say no when I've emailed them and said, hey, I'd really like this paper, but I'm not paying 150 dollars for it. Um, and uh, the, the response is always, here's the paper and an attachment. It's fantastic. Um, another way to learn new things is to go to conferences. Um, going to conferences, you get to interact with people who have experiences different than yours from other parts of the world, and you'll learn awesome things. Um, one of the wonderful things about Food Cafe is that it's a conference every day. And so uh, when you uh, visit user groups or come to meetups at Food Cafe, then you are you're getting the interaction with other people who are local to you, which is really uh, useful as well. Um, so you're expanding your network if you want to be, you know, a sociopath and worry about, you know, how far your your social reach is and things like that. Um, you'll learn excellent things. You'll meet excellent people, and you'll just have a better understanding of how your work uh, integrates with the community around you. Um, so yeah, so I, uh, when I, when I was getting ready to move to Malware, I knew one Swede, <coughs> um, Esther, who, who, uh, some people may know, she's involved in Pukave, and, uh, she was the only person from Sweden that I knew. When we moved to Sweden, I had never been to Sweden before, we just moved, and hoped we liked it. Um, and, uh, Fukuve was one of the things that I was really looking forward to when I moved here, um, because... I like being active in the community and helping out um, because, you know, to, to be really honest, the things that my skills are put, as a software developer, the things that my skills are used for in the industry are not that interesting. Um, and probably, I know all the Silicon Valley starts saying, oh, we're making the world a better place for rich white people. Um, but actually, they're not really making the world a better place, and most of what I do, I don't get a lot of fulfillment out of. Um, and so it's really great to be a part of a community and interact with other people who also want to be a part of a community. And that's what I get out of Fukafea, and uh, that's what I hope uh, you'll also get out of it in the future. And that's all I have to say about that. Any questions? We got time for a question or two. You can ask them here or